Hey everybody, so in this video we are going to revisit the topic of types of chemical bonds. Now I've talked about this a little bit in the past, I've talked about basic differences between ionic bonding and covalent bonding, and we get to learn about uh, how to name simple binary ionic compounds and binary molecular compounds. So we've all, we've been through all that stuff before, but we're going to get a little bit more thorough in today's description of types of chemical bonds. So the target audience for this video is an audience that understands the quantum mechanical model of the atom and periodic properties of the elements. So in order to really fully understand this video, um, you need to know all about orbitals, quantum numbers, ground state electron configurations, periodic properties of the elements, so things like um, ionization energies and so on. So if you don't know about those things, feel free to check out my content. Uh, I'll put a link to it in the description or otherwise direct you to that content if, you, if you're not familiar with it. Um, but if you, if you are familiar with that, then you're ready to understand the content of this video. So just to review chemical bonding briefly, a chemical bond is basically just an attraction between atoms and it occurs because chemical bonding lowers the potential energy of the atoms. If you have two atoms, then in general, the potential energy of those atoms when they're bonded together is lower than the potential energy of those atoms when they are not bonded together. So it's kind of like a quid pro quo, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, we'll form a bond, we'll have this mutually beneficial arrangement where, we'll, where we will both uh, lower our potential energy because in the end that's really the goal of nature is to reach the minimum potential energy possible and one of the ways to do that is by forming chemical bonds. So the three types of chemical bonds that we're going to talk about today are ionic bonding, covalent bonding, and metallic bonding. And one of the things that all three of these types of chemical bonds have in common is they all deal with valence electrons. So valence electrons, remember, those are the ones that are in the outermost principal energy level of the atom. And these are the ones that participate in these various types of chemical bonding. The other electrons, the inner principal energy level electrons, the core electrons, as they're called, uh, they don't really participate in chemical bonding. It's all about the valence electrons. And so it's particularly important to be able to identify, uh, just by looking at an element's position in the periodic table, look at that element and figure out immediately how many valence electrons it has. And there's a, a, a nifty way to do that. So if you have a like a photocopy of a periodic table, then you might want to pause the video and get that out because I'm going to show you a very useful trick to identify how many electrons are in an atom of a, uh, of a main group element. For the transition elements, it's a little weird and sometimes the number of valence electrons is not very predictable, but for main group elements, it's very predictable. So here's what you do. What you're going to do is you're going to erase helium from its usual position all the way on the right hand, upper right hand corner of that periodic table and you're going to fill in helium right next to hydrogen, right next to hydrogen, right above beryllium. So helium has a new position for this particular uh, periodic table. Then what you're going to do is you're going to fold your periodic table such that the boron group is adjacent to the alkaline earth metals. So boron should be right next to beryllium. After that, what you're going to do is you're going to number the resulting groups from 1 to 8. And once you've numbered those groups, now any element belonging to any of those groups is going to have that number of valence electrons. So if it's in group 3, it's going to have 3 valence electrons. If it's in group 6, it's going to have uh, 6 valence electrons. So again, this is a very useful trick to identify how many valence electrons an atom of each one of these elements has. So with that in mind, um, now, that we are, uh, now that we understand the concept of valence electrons and how important they are to chemical bonding and we know how to identify uh, how many valence electrons a main group element has, uh, let's talk about the actual nature of chemical bonding itself. Um, in general, and this applies to all of these types of chemical bonding, uh, the reason why these atoms like to form these various types of chemical bonds is that they're all trying to achieve what's called a noble gas electron configuration. So noble gases, their electron configurations are very, very stable because the outermost principal energy level of a noble gas is completely full of electrons. So you can think of the other elements in the periodic table as like jealous 
of the noble gases. They really want to be like those noble gases. They want to have the same electron configuration as the nearest noble gas in the periodic table. And, and typically, uh, sometimes that means you know losing electrons to get a noble gas configuration. Sometimes that means gaining electrons to achieve that noble gas configuration. And other times that means sharing electrons with other atoms, again, to achieve that noble gas electron configuration. And so one way to, it's kind of a useful bookkeeping tool to keep track of the valence electrons that are participating in chemical bonding is to represent the valence electrons using dots. So oftentimes you will see a chemical symbol of an element with dots around it. The dots represent the valence electrons. The chemical symbol represents the nucleus and all those core electrons. And depending on how many valence electrons that element has, you will, um, you'll see that number of dots located around the atom. And what you want to do is, is you want to imagine that there are four regions, four sides around the chemical symbol. And as you're filling in dots, you're going to populate one dot on each of the four sides. And then if you have more than four valence electrons to place around that atom, uh, then you can start to double up. So for instance, if we have nitrogen, nitrogen we know based on its position in the periodic table has five valence electrons. And so if we want to represent those around the N, around the chemical symbol, then we're going to go one, two, three, four, five. And this would represent an electron dot structure, also called a Lewis dot structure, for a nitrogen atom. So now we know how to represent valence electrons with dots. Now let's talk a little bit more about what's really going on with these types of chemical bonds and why they form, starting with ionic bonding. So recall that metals, uh, well, before I go any further, remember ionic bonding involves the transfer of electrons and it occurs usually between a metal and a nonmetal. So the metal will lose electrons, the nonmetal will gain electrons, a cation forms from the metal and an anion or negatively charged ion forms uh, from the nonmetal. And the ionic bond is this non-directional electrostatic force between cations and anions. And it results in this large infinite network um, called a lattice. So just to get a little bit more specific, the reason why ionic bonding occurs is because metals in general have fairly low ionization energies and so it's easy for them to lose electrons and become cations. And nonmetals generally have fairly high ionization energies and so they don't like to lose electrons, but they do have relatively high electron affinities and so they're very quick to gain electrons to form anions. So that's in general the basics of ionic bonding. We will talk a little bit more about ionic bonding, lattice energy, and things like that in the future. Um, but for now, let's turn our attention to covalent bonding. Covalent bonding, remember, is the type of bonding that involves the sharing of valence electrons between two nonmetals. So again, like I said, nonmetals, they tend to have very high ionization energies. They do not like to lose electrons. Um, sometimes they like to gain electrons, but other times, uh, they will share valence electrons with one another to achieve a noble gas electron configuration. So that is covalent bonding. And then the third type of chemical bonding is called metallic bonding. And this is the type of chemical bonding that occurs only in metals. So let's say I have a sample of solid sodium metal. Um, the model that, that best describes how these sodium metal atoms are joined together is what we call the electron C model. So what, what the electron C model is in, in a nutshell, it's basically like a giant pool where all of those sodium atoms have lost their valence electron. Remember, sodium has one valence electron. So just imagine a huge collection of sodium atoms and all of those sodium atoms each cough up their one valence electron to form basically a huge cluster of sodium ions, Na pluses, right? So you have this huge cluster of Na pluses, and then surrounding that you have this big pool, this big sea of electrons that are free to move around the metal. And I had a chemistry professor who um, 
use a really good analogy that I'd like to share with you about the Electron C model is to imagine like a big giant underground or an <laughs> in-ground pool, a big giant pool filled to the brim with ping pong balls. And imagine that that pool is just absolutely full of ping pong balls so that if you shove one more ping pong ball in there, then you're going to get another ping pong ball popping out somewhere else on the other side of the pool. That's basically what the Electron C model represents. And it's actually a very convenient way to describe metals because it explains how well metals conduct electricity. The reason why metals conduct electricity is because those electrons are free to flow around through the entire surface, the entire network of that metal. So those are the three types of chemical bonds in a nutshell. Uh, we will certainly talk about them more thoroughly in the future, but I think this is a good stopping point. So um, that is all. I hope you learned a few things from this video that you didn't know before, and I can't wait to see you next time. Have a good one.